Neil Marriott is the second counselor in the Young Women General Presidency of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She grew up in a Methodist home in Louisiana, earned a degree at Southern Methodist University, and later worked as a secretary at Harvard. While there, she joined the LDS Church and dedicated her life to serving others, especially her husband, 11 children, and 32 grandchildren. Her current church assignment is in the worldwide service to young women aged 12 through 18, where she has met young women and leaders in Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Hong Kong, Mongolia, Cambodia, South Africa, and Brazil, as well as in the United States. She hopes to inspire young women to stand up for themselves, get a good education, and find purpose in contributing to their homes and communities through unselfish service. I feel like we have been well fed, don't you think? And um, we've, we've heard about being merry when, we're, when you're in charge of six, 60,000 people. We've heard about being courageous and letting go of fear and learning to be a weightlifter, which is quite the, the amazing thing. And we have learned about having courage and facing broken bones and breast cancer with such a positive teamwork attitude. So I feel like I've been richly, richly blessed. Thank you so much. I would like to talk, and I see so many young women out here, that I would like to talk especially to you. Um, I'm going to take you back to a time when I was 12 years old. I learned about leadership hiking out on a fast sailboat in the middle of a big storm. There, I, I would like to share some principles of leadership with you about that. Let me make sure this is done right. My family is from Louisiana. I'm from the South, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> and uh, and uh, in Louisiana, there's water everywhere, rivers, lakes, and so we became a family of sailors because there was so much water to enjoy. So Daddy, being a veteran sailor, I'm going to have to take this off Mary too, I think. Um, he taught us all the parts of the sailboat and how to do it, but he was always the skipper. But one day on Lake St. John, a big long lake, we got in the boat, my brother, my father, and me, and he said to me as a 12-year-old, Neil, you're the skipper for the day. This was a big honor. I was 12. I had their life in my hands. And I, it, I felt that power. So we started off on a sunny day, all the way down this long lake. It took a long time. A light breeze blowing, no problems. I was feeling quite the triumphant sailor. We get to the end of the lake. I'm doing great. And we come about. And as we come about, the sky starts to darken. The clouds start to build, and the wind picks up. Well, at first I was exhilarated. I'm holding the line on the mainsail. The jib is billowing out in front. The sitter board starts to hum. That's a real sign that you've got everything going right. And even there was a wake, a frothy white wake, following behind the boat. It was exciting. I was hiking out, and all this was going on while I was feeling so great. But then the wind got stronger. The sky got darker. The wind picked up to the point that I was no longer exhilarated. I was terrified. And I, holding on to the line, hooked to the mainsail, I looked over at my father at the end of the boat. He looked at me. He nodded and smiled. And I thought, oh, good. I'll just take the, main, the line on the mainsail and uncleat it. Snap it right out of that cleat, let the wind spill out of the sails, and the sail will luff. That just means flap. And we will no longer be heeling, which means leaning far, far over. And I will no longer have to be hiking out. And just as I get ready to lift the line out of the cleat, Daddy calls out, Neil, hold what you've got. Hold what you've got. I didn't want to do that. What have I got? <laughs> I've got? I've got a storm on my hands. And my brain started a conversation. One side was saying, you ninny, uncleat that line. Straighten up quick. You're going to capsize in the dark, cold water. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to uncleat. But before I could, the other side of my brain says, your father that you trust and love has just spoken to you and given you counsel. 
He is saying, you can do this. You've got it. Hold on to your course. Keep going. Which one was I going to listen to? I chose to listen to my father's voice. I chose to hold on to what I had. And the boat shot forward, and we made it back to the dock. Oh, that was a moment of triumph. I felt like I had really accomplished something. Now, what are the leadership principles that we learned, we can learn from that? My father, a veteran sailor, could have hopped up, come to the front of the boat, taken the line, trimmed the sails, kept us from healing so far, and got us back much more quickly and less awkwardly than I did to the dock. And it wouldn't have been dangerous. But I would not have learned anything. He trusted me. He sat still. He gave me courage. He was aware of my needs, but he let me handle it. Those are leadership principles everyone here can do. You all have a sphere of influence. Everyone sitting in a chair right now carries around them what I describe as a hula hoop. A hula hoop of a circle of influence. Right where you're sitting, you are influencing the person on your left and your right, behind you and in front of you, by what you are radiating out. By your face, your attitude, your feelings, your interest. We are constantly influencing other people. That's called leadership. We've heard from fabulous leaders today. I've been inspired, and I'm not going to forget what you said. I think everyone here has a certain faith. In fact, probably in this, in this group, there are, there's representatives from many faith-based communities. My faith-based community is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I've been given responsibility in it, and I love it. I also have a huge responsibility in my home. I, I, I kind of had to laugh. I have 32 grandchildren, unless you're a prophet. <laughs> uh, but that's good news. I mean, <laughs> the more the merrier. But, but um, in any case, I was given the assignment today to speak on leadership in the home and leadership in the church. In the home, as a mother, we have a position of power, great power. I think everyone here who's spoken has spoken tenderly of their children. Well, I think tenderly of mine, too, because in the home there's great power. Now, my mother, the mother of seven, also had great power. I learned from her. See, her circle of influence was affecting me. She had a saying, and it was this. My job is to prepare you to be kicked out of the nest. <laughs> Sounds kind of hard, but we knew from early on, man, at 18, we're getting kicked out of the nest. And she kept that up. Along with that, she would say, because you are going to college. You are getting an education, and you've got to be ready. And we were ready, because she kept that up all the time. My mother is like the jib on a, a sailboat. There's the mainsail. I'll think of that as myself or as you. My mother was the jib because, you see, the jib increases the speed and progress of the boat. The mainsail holds most of the air, and the jib shapes the wind current around the mainsail and causes a certain pressure that actually lifts or pulls the boat forward, kind of like a, a vertical airplane wing. You know, it has a certain shape that the air flows over it, and it lifts the plane. Well, that's what the jib does for the mainsail and the boat. That was mother. She shaped events and experiences so we would have hands-on experience. So we would have to experience what it was like to get self-reliant and to be ready to be kicked out of the nest. I, I call her power kitchen power, and I'm not talking about casseroles. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about courage, compassion, and challenging her kids to move forward. And, I'll put it out here, to move forward and to do what best they can do. And what is that? I love what St. Teresa, Mother Teresa, said. She said, if you want to bring happiness to the whole world, go home and love your family. That's power. That's leadership. 
Mothers are powerful in their own right, but they send kids out. I don't know if you heard of the story I told a while back at a, at a conference of our church where I received a phone call and this person had seen a picture of my family. And she called up and she said, is this Neil Marriott? And I said, yes. And she said, I'm highly offended. How dare you bring 11 children into a world that's full of people who are starving? Oh gosh, how did I dare? And I said, well, um, I, I think I know how you feel. She said, you do not know how I feel. Oh, I said, I guess I don't know how you feel. <laughs> and, and she said, um, well, she went on a rant, talking, talking, talking. And when she took a breath, I, having said a prayer to get help, said, wait, I want to make you a promise. She stopped. She said, what? And I said, I promise you I will do everything in my power to raise these children so they will go out and make the world a better place. She said, well, I hope you do. And she hung up. Mothers have a great power. We all have a mother. We all have a home. And we all have a circle of influence. What are you putting in yours that radiates out and influences and leads others to a better place, a happier place? In my home, I can remember when my, one of my sons, 15 years old, came through the back door, burst through the back door after school, slammed his books down on the counter and said, so, what is truth? <laughs> Rebellious, challenging, angry. This was an important moment. I prayerfully turned to Canon and said, Canon, I don't know much, but I know this. You have a Father in heaven who loves you and a Savior who is Jesus Christ. That is true. His demeanor changed. I watched his eyes fill up with tears, and he turned around and ran up the stairs, I guess, to his bedroom. We never mentioned it again until a couple of years ago. Twenty years now have passed. This son, father of eight, comes over and puts his arm around me, my shoulder, and says, Mom, do you remember that day that I came through the back door from school and threw my books on the counter? I said, yeah, because it was such a powerful moment. He said, Mom, what you said changed the course of my life. Three little sentences. Why were they powerful? Because I was able to say with conviction what I knew was true. Sisters, may I call you sisters? <laughs> that popped out, but we are sisters. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have a responsibility to know what is true, to have a conviction and a voice to say it. Have it brimming right at the top of your heart, ready to spill over when someone needs you to tell them what is true, what is it you know? What can you say with love, compassion, understanding, and conviction? You will lead that person to a better place if you will do it. There's other leadership principles besides speaking clearly what you know is true. When I was in the fifth grade, I had a fifth grade teacher named Ms. Henderson. She was formidable. She was tall, she had a loud voice, she was scary, and she was really big on arithmetic. And I was terrible on arithmetic. My husband tells me and admits, I'm really bad with math. <laughs> but, he says, you've had 11 children, so you know how to multiply. <laughs> but that's not the point of the story. <laughs> it just popped out too, sisters. <laughs> I, I come home from school with this heavy heart. I'm scared to death because Miss Henderson has given us page after page of long division. And I sit down at my little desk in my bedroom and the wiping the tears away, erasing on that school paper until there were holes in the page, trying to get the answers right, knowing that I'm going to be killed tomorrow in fifth grade because my sign mode would be terrible. And Daddy walks in the room. He sits down on the edge of the bed. He doesn't say a word. I look over at him and he smiles, nods, and hope blooms in my heart. I still remember it exactly where I was sitting and I begin to think more clearly and work through the, the long division problems more steadily. And then he walks out and my confidence just walked right out with him. The tears started, the holes in the paper started, and then he came back 
and he sat again, and I began to gain courage. That is influence. That is leadership. Do you know what leadership really is? It's relationship. I have a trusted relationship with him. I trust his presence. He calms my soul. I could do better. You can do that. There is someone who needs you to have that kind of relationship so that when they've got an arithmetic problem they can't handle, you can just sit there. You don't solve it for them. You're just there for them. They need you. The world needs you. The world needs to know they can trust you, that you'll be there for them. Now, when our children all grew up and left the nest, I thought, wahoo. <laughs> I can relax. I, I, I can take a minute for myself. No. I got a phone call from President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, who is the pres in the presidency of my church, the first presidency. In his office, I sat down, and he said, Sister Marriott, and then he spoke a few nice words, and then he in issued an invitation to me to become a leader of 500,000 teenage girls. <laughs> you have been a teenage girl. One teenage girl is a challenge. Imagine half a million. I'm stunned. I numbly agree to do this. And then he says, well, how do you feel? <laughs> the tears begin to roll. And I said, I feel inadequate. Now he, in the same pattern of leadership as my father at the end of the boat, did not save the day. He didn't jump in and say, oh, Sister Mary, you'll be just fine. You'll be great. He didn't say anything. He just sat there kindly looking at me. What he did by that is give me space to dig down inside to say, well, what am I holding on to? What have I got? Just like Daddy called out, hold what you've got. It gave me time to think, what, can, what am I feeling? What am I holding to? How can I do this? That's a great leader who doesn't rush in and save it, who has enough trust and confidence in that person to say, let's hold what you've got. What can you do with this? And I dug deep, and then I knew. And I said, I am inadequate. But the Lord is not inadequate. I'll depend on him. And I put a stake in the ground. I had voiced what I needed to voice, and I held on to that position. Why? Because he, in his brilliant leadership, gave me time, held still, trusted in me, and let me find it. That is true leadership. Now, in this position in the church, I travel, and it's a joy. In fact, I have Sister Carol McConkie here, and she just, she's traveled quite a bit, too. I've been to, oh, all sorts of places, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, Mongolia. All through my travels, I find girls that look like you. They're bright. They're steady. They look you in the eye. One in particular I met was named Tita in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Tita, as you can see, shines. Let me tell you where she lives. She lives down a concrete alley strewn with garbage and stray dogs. My husband and I have walked there. We walk down this alley, concrete sides on, uh, of, uh, walls on each side, to a hole, and we step inside to her home, a concrete box, no windows a loft above to sleep in, a tiny kitchen on the side. And we sat on a wooden frame that held a, a dirty mattress. Where her father lay, he is incapacitated, doesn't support the family. And there were several chairs in there. Tita's sitting on one, her mother is sitting on one. This 13-year-old girl, Cambodian girl, shines with a bright light. Why? because she's holding on to what she's got. And what is that? She has got a view of the dock far ahead. She is going to get an education. She gets up in the morning, puts on this clean shirt, goes out and gets on a bus and dry, rides to school, then goes to seminary, then comes home and helps her mother. They just have each other. Do you think Tita is a leader? I know she is. 
She has a vision of where she has to go. And not only that, just like my sailboat, she is leaving this frothy, beautiful, white wake as she moves that is beckoning to other girls that live in that alley. They're wanting to get an education too. Every one of us has a sphere of influence. Every one of us. Well, I will tell you that a time came in our life, David's and mine, when most of the children were in school or married or working, and we received an opportunity to lead 200 missionaries in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So we moved down there with our three young sons and began the work of a mission for my church, and it was fabulous. We were working so hard, we were engaged, we were at full sail. The jib was ballooning, the mainsail was full, we were holding on to the line, and we were moving. And we got a phone call. Our 21-year-old daughter, Georgia, a senior in violin performance on scholarship at Indiana University, had been hit by a truck while she was riding her bicycle. She was in critical condition in the hospital. I immediately boarded a plane from Brazil and was flying to Indiana. But before I even got out of the area of South America, Georgia died. So when I got there, she was gone. The, if I can put it this way, the wind went out of my sails. The line went slack. I couldn't see the dock anymore. It was all confusing. What was I going to do? Well, to use the sailboat analogy, there was a cleat on the sailboat. And I put my line in that. It was my husband. He was steady. He moved ahead, soldiered on with faith. And I followed his pattern. You know, we all have influence, but there may be times in all of our lives when we just can't see our way. When that time comes, you look for a leader, a pattern that you can follow. And you will be that leader in that pattern at times, your very own self, so be ready. But also, I would, I would counsel you to be vulnerable and to be humble enough to say, I need help, and reach for it. Reach for your cleat, put your line in, and hold on, and that's what I did, and it worked. But up to a point only, because I could go through the motions, and I could continue to teach and lead in Brazil, but my heart wasn't quite healed. In fact, there was a big hole in it. And I found, and maybe you need to do this too, I found a holy place, my holy place. It was by a big window in our ninth floor apartment. that We didn't need a screen. And I would open it up three feet across, five feet high, after David and the boys were asleep. And I would stand there, look out at the night sky, and just let the troubles tumble out. Pour them out to another father, a heavenly father. He was what I call a nearby leader. He was near, he was listening. And degree by degree, peace began to come to my heart. I felt supported, just like I had when Daddy sat without making a sound on the edge of my bed. We need to reach out to this most merciful mentor, the greatest leader we have. We need to take that voyage on that sailboat with a captain who is our Father in Heaven. And as we do, we will leave a wake behind for others to follow us in that same pattern. So the time will come when we're all helping each other return to a harbor, to a dock that is full of joy, growth, hope, promise, and togetherness. <laughs>